like to begin by introducing myself. My name is Claire Finan, and I'm the program coordinator here at Parktown Place, as well as the programming director at Inliquid, uh, which is a nonprofit organization that works closely with Parktown Place. We would like to humbly acknowledge the Lenape peoples on whose ancestral homelands we gather, and as well as the diverse and vibrant Native communities who make their homes here today. This talk is brought to you by Inliquid and Parktown Place Museum District Residences, a premier air communities property. Situated here in the heart of the Benjamin Franklin Parkway, Parktown has dedicated themselves to making the arts an amenity. In addition to be surrounded by neighboring arts institutions, Parktown Place has brought the arts inside their buildings through their rich permit collections, regular art workshops, classes, events, artist talks like this, and three separate gallery spaces for rotational temporary exhibitions. The current temporary exhibition is Taking a Line for a Walk, which highlights the work of six artists whose work is united by line as a formal and conceptual concept. First, we will hear from Kate Stewart. Kate received her MFA from the University of Pennsylvania and her BA from Dickinson College. Her work has been included in a group and in, in group and solo exhibitions, including at the Tate Modern in London, Plug Projects in Kansas, the Institute of Contemporary Art here in Philadelphia, among several others. Kate is an avid gardener and has been instrumental in bringing a pigment garden to Westchester University, where she currently teaches. Following Kate, we will hear from Samara Weaver. Samara is a graduate of the Tyler School of Art and Architecture. Her work has been exhibited at the James Mary Gallery in Wisconsin, the Charlie Cummings Gallery in Florida, the Delaware Art Museum, among others. Samara is currently based in Wilmington, Delaware, where she also works as an architect. Tonight, Kate and Samara will be diving into their studio practices and their inspirations. At the end of both presentations, there will be a dedicated time for questions, and afterwards, we can go as a group to uh, tour the exhibition itself. So without further ado, please welcome Kate Stewart. Hello. Hello. I'm Kate Ann Stewart. Um, thanks for coming out. I'm seeing a lot of folks I haven't seen in a while, which is really exciting. Um, and yeah, I, I read, I, I have like a million talks at this point. Um, so I sort of redid this one to um, really address mainly the paintings because I work in um, uh, mostly painting, but drawing, sculptures, collage, um, installation-based work. Um, but everything sort of stemmed from my interest in drawing and painting and my background in drawing and painting. So that's where I really have like the most I would say art baggage is within drawing and painting. Um, and some of the work you'll see in the exhibitions um, that are up right now, but um, I'm, I'm primarily showing work that isn't in the show, so that it kind of creates a sort of uh, backstory or fills things in for, for you. Um, so, so I'm really, um, in, in considering and thinking about the evolution of my work over um, the decades, um, I keep going back to this sort of, um, I don't, I don't want to say like this, this sort of tome or this um, manifesto, but the transcendentalist painters, I love this part of their, um, their sort of area of interest in terms of being um, painters that um, painting would sort of carry beyond the appearance, appearance of the physical world through new concepts of space, color, light, and design to imaginative realms that are idealistic and spiritual. I, I resonate with that. Um, I'm not necessarily at all really religious or um, all that spiritual, but I do get, um, I can kind of wedge myself in there in that, in that quote and think about the way that the landscape affects me physically um, and sort of metaphysically. But um, so I'm gonna be sort of talking about like different interpretations of the landscape, things that are interesting to me are sort of real or imagined landscapes. So interior landscapes within the, within the brain, exterior landscapes, the way that we process 
um, the landscape um, and, and the natural world. Um, utopian visions of the landscape, dystopian um, visions of the landscape, dystopian um, interpretations that have maybe to do with socio-political interpretations of the landscape. Those are sort of things that I have sort of, I don't know, processed and filtered through in my work. Um, but also um, synesthesia sort of responses to uh, light and color and the sort of basic formal element of things that we experience in the landscape. So I'm not going to get too much headier than that. But, um, uh, but so these are some earlier works that um, I think kind of, they're, they're sort of these sandwich paintings that are sort of um, trying to figure themselves out or trying to figure out how I use imagery, how I'm processing the landscape. Um, or how I consider nature and myself in it. Um, these, these two paintings have, like, I don't have figures in my work very much, but um, I have them implanted in these and their self-portraits, um, where the hope is in these paintings is that the, the natural world and the environment around kind of dwarfs the figure. There's a scale in t intention here where the, the figures are small and sort of lower in the composition, so they feel like they're being um, almost overwhelmed or um, enveloped by the landscape. So the imagery for me um, goes, so, sort of depends so much on my own interaction and uh, with weather events. Um, my husband is also an artist and has um, gone out to the Midwest and done tornado chasing. We, we eloped out there, like we, we've done it together. And the, the way that the weather and energy feels in the moment when, um, when it's sort of rushing on you is something that I'm interested in trying to maybe depict in the paintings, but allude to more so, not, not illustrate. Um, so the tents in this particular painting, they sort of represent the figure. So I have stand-ins for the figure. Um, this is much more of a dystopian um, uh, landscape painting referencing tent cities that have popped up um, uh, over centuries, really. Um, um, but again, you know, the, there's always this sort of sense of land and space and air in the work. Um, uh, you know, the, this is a, based on a, a, the one on the left is actually based on um, a city, an artisan village in France called Cord, um, that is sort of one of those mountain villages, but um, a medieval village, but it feels so figurative to me or figural to me. And so I, I um, the way that the na natural world is sort of engulfing it, um, I find at the time, I was really interested in how nature might be taking over or, or also becoming almost like stand-ins for the figure or even um, costume in some sort of way. That's a painting of my husband. You wouldn't know it. Um, more uh, sort of figure references within the landscape. Um, I, I'm, I'm showing these essentially just to give you a sense of like, the building up or the tra transition to my much more sort of non-representational work where that kind of comes from. So you're gonna see a lot of, um, the subject matter is very centrally located if you're thinking about just composition basically, um, where then there's this sort of expanse around the figure um, that is some sort of destination, visual destination, allusion to a landscape space um, and, and to the landscape. Um, so again, the sort of energy really kind of fixates on the interior of the painting compositionally. Um, all at the same time, I've been doing, or I was doing um, sculptures and installations where I was like physically trying to understand what that representation of air and weather and maybe even potential aftermath might feel like to actually construct, so it's sort of constructing something that's being deconstructed, if that makes sense. Um, this I've done th this installation many times. Um, this was really the last one I did. I felt like I really milked it. 
Um, but you can see where that comes into some of the paintings and the paintings actually, um, you know, in, infuse or sort of uh, infuse themselves in the sculptures and installation. Um, these, this is sort of a, a back, kind of back, in, just in my studio. I never show these works, but these are mandalas that I've been making for um, almost 10 years um, as a way to, so uh, at the time that I was doing the sculptures and installations, I was really having a, um, a hiccup in my painting practice. Um, and that happens often for artists. I felt like I needed to switch gears and do physical stuff, more physical stuff that, that um, uh, wasn't involved necessarily just with painting. Um, when I decided to get back to painting, I, I had no idea where to begin. I wanted to make something that felt less literal um, than the paintings that I was making prior to, to this time. Um, I felt like the installations were quite literal and that sort of thing. I wanted something that wasn't as planned. Um, so basically, um, these mandalas serve as preparatory exercises. I, I just give myself 10 minutes. I time myself for 10 minutes. And um, out of these um, sort of exercises, I do right when I um, enter the studio, um, I think they started to kind of filter, or they had started to filter into the work, whether it's color, light, design, um, or even just the acknowledgement that I needed more spontaneity um, in, in my practice. Um, so I'm searching, searching, searching in these sort of earlier paintings. This one on the left is called Derecho, um, where I'm, I'm like trying physically to kind of understand what it is that I'm after, I think. And this is me like trying to be an art historian about myself, I, not that way. Um, but essentially the activity starts to center around the middle portion in the right hand side and taking away the ground was this revelatory feeling for me. The ground meaning like the ground plane, the landscape surface, the land itself felt freeing. Um, every semester I teach pers linear perspective. I show this really corny video that um, always ends with this Montaigne painting and I realize in my eyes, I think, oh my God, I'm doing Montaigne. Oh. Um, and thinking about that, that Oculus as a portal um, really started to resonate with me. Um, so I'm gonna, I see I only have a minute left, I think. Um, <laughs> So I'm gonna try and speed through this. Um, <laughs> so um, this is sort of some of my work trying to sort of figure out that idea of not just like figure ground, but um, uh, space that has some sort of resonance that, um, is it an object? Is it a space? Are we entering through? Are we rejected from this um, in terms of formal ideas in the work and materiality. I'm very interested in, especially this one on the left was done at Vermont Studio Center um, for a residency I had. And I started using really crappy materials like that you'd find in Lowe's, uh, sparkly um, spray paint or the craft section at Michael's and realizing that like having these sort of high and low um, um, materials coming together was some, some sort of excitement for me, almost like a stockpiling of materials. Um, so these are a few more in that realm. Um, I'm very interested in the edges and obviously those, these are portals. These are, these are Tondo paintings um, that help me kind of get through um, thinking about the way I think about composition. Um, little things that I've discovered along the way are, I, I collect a bunch of different Artwork Anonymous Sakali cards that are essentially in initiation meditation cards. 
Um, but what I was excited about in, in discovering them and collecting them is that they have this kind of central motif that for some reason keeps coming up for me in my, in my work. Um, I'm not intentional about that. It just comes through, I don't know what that means, but um, uh, meditation is part of my uh, life. Um, and I also have a, a sort of, since I was a child, a synesthesia, where I see colors that are referencing sounds, or so when I hear sounds, um, I think of textures and colors. And so that comes into the work as well. Um, just really quick, getting through here. Um, I, what I thought was really fascinating, or what I've been thinking about as being really fascinating is how much this sort of these similar motifs come through in really varying religions and uh, religious practices and spiritual practices that um, are oftentimes at odds with one another but then there's this kind of humanity that um, somehow we're drawn to that um, I'm almost done um, so these are a few more paintings um, I was able to do a residency at the Golden um, Foundation that they produce all of the golden um, art supplies, um, golden artist colors. Um, I love materials. And um, what I was able to, to really hone in on there was how materiality can also offer these different levels of experience and different levels of um, reality, if you will. You know, the way that the surface is one reality in and of itself, the flatness of the surface. So you can see the coarseness of something laid on top. And then there's an elise, sort of illusion of space, a depth of space. And all of those things are intended to, um, to, to almost be at odds with one another, but they're also somewhat um, synonymous. Um, this is a really clunky, weird quarantine drawing I thought I'd put in there because I had a break during, from painting during that time um, and getting back to it, I wanted to just highlight this. This, this is the same exact painting in the same exact state, but the one on the left is without a flash in natural light and the one on the right is with a flash. Um, this is a material that I've discovered and I pull into my work as another layer to offer another layer of experience or another layer of reality. Um, uh, it's actually glass that's found in road paint um, and makes it reflective. Um, these are a few more paintings and the glass bead is something that I utilize quite a bit in the work now. Um, I have to refrain from using too much too many shiny things and sparkly things because I'm still my seven-year-old self. Um, so I got to really pull back. Um, and then I do do murals and things like that. This is a mural that I did in Harrisburg. Um, these are my buddies on the bottom right who helped me with it. Um, lots of people helped me with it. But that illusion to space, then for, for me, I was excited. It's just a parking lot. But then the way that we could kind of almost create the open up that horrible concrete block wall um, to connect to the sky felt um, really exciting um, in, a, in an urban natural setting. So um, anyway, thank you very much. Hello everyone, I'm Samara Weaver. Thanks for all coming out today. Um, I have my background in architecture. I got my bachelor's and master's in architecture from Tyler, um, and I'm currently working in architecture in Philadelphia as well. Um, so I'm gonna tell you a little bit about my process and how I kind of ended up with the work that you're going to see today. And then I look forward to any questions when we're all done. Um, so I'm gonna start a little bit with process and then I'll start rolling through the, or not process, my, my path and I'll then go into the slides. So the picture that's up here is a close up from one of my sculptural watercolors. Um, I paint loads and loads of trace paper, 
and then create these layers, which I'll talk a little bit more about later. But that process actually came out of experimentation and doing paper flowers for a friend's wedding. And, you know, of course my friend asks me, can you help me with the paper flowers for my wedding? We're gonna do this, this, and this. And I take it to the absolute next level of, oh, I need to come up with different textures and, and types of paper and I need translucency and, and all of that stuff. So as in that exploration for something completely not related to my personal artistic practice, I discovered um, certain properties of using trace paper and paper in general in this way and then went on this path of exploring it further in my, in my artwork. Um, in terms of getting my start working as an artist and showing, in grad school I was able to take glass blowing classes and as I generally do I kind of took it to the next level and for my midterm and final project I proposed creating this large sculpture which is 20 feet long. It has four five foot sections and it's six feet high and 18 inches wide. Um, and Thankfully, my teacher was like, all right, sure, you want to do something that big? Go ahead, let's do it. Um, it has almost 1,600 glass tubes that I flame worked all of them and created something that was more complex out of a bunch of simple pieces. So that's a theme that continues through my work where the items by themselves might be really simple, but in their arrangement, Together, they create a more complex and interesting piece. Um, same thing with my paper works. They're created out of layers and layers of strips of paper. And if you just took one of the strips of paper, it's just a colored strip of paper. But then together, they become much more interesting. Um, so this piece, made in grad school, I was able to have an extending sh extended showing of it at the school. Um, and of course, as soon as I take it down, my glass teacher's like, oh no, you took it down? We, we should have seen if you could have um, had like a permanent place here and had the, the school acquire it because I show my students that piece all the time. It's like, come on. <laughs> um, in 2000, that was in, I graduated in 2013. In 2018, I actually applied for a show at the Delaware Art Museum. For me, that was kind of a long shot, even though I made lots of art, I loved making art, I loved creating. Um, you know, I went to school for architecture and that was what I saw myself as an architect. Um, so I applied for this show, I got into the show, I was absolutely amazed and excited and thrilled and finally kind of was like, you know what, people appreciate my work. I am an artist, I can claim that title. And I installed the piece when I was nine months pregnant, four days away from my due date. <laughs> um, a lot of people saw that picture and were like, why are you on a ladder? I was like, I'm pregnant, I'm not you know, dying, come on. Um, then <laughs> at the opening for the show, I had had my daughter, she like was a week late it was perfect timing and she was two weeks old at the show and so I got to attend the first show that I had that I was part of at a museum with my husband and my two week old, which was wonderful. Um, I have shown this piece a couple of times. The last time was in conjunction with Design Philadelphia at the Center for Design and Architecture in Philadelphia. Um, I did that show and installed the piece, and I also, I'm gonna flip back and forth for a second. I also had a booth at the Cherry Street Pier where I showed a bunch of other mediums that I work in. Um, to talk a little bit more about this piece, one of the things I love about it is that it's different every time I install it because every time I install it, I have to fix pieces that have broken because tubes always break. Uh, me installing this equals lots of broken glass on the ground and cut fingers and a lot of time and, and labor to do this. Um, and so there's a, about a week period beforehand where I'm trimming glass tubes, reflame working them, doing some planning. I do have a, a glass perch in my basement so I can do everything in my studio, which is wonderful. Um, and then the install process is 
both a combination of planning and kind of intuition, seeing what looks good, seeing what feels good in the time. This piece was designed with the thought of, as an architect, generally glass is used to create transparency and vistas while still protecting us from noise or weather or temperature, what have you. Um, I wanted to kind of turn that idea on its head and create something that shaped space, affected the way that you perceived space, and changed when it was perceived from different directions. So I'm gonna bop back for a second again. So the picture on the right is the piece from the front. It's only into 18 inches wide, and the glass itself is probably you know three, four inches wide. So it almost disappears when you're looking at it from the front. But when you look at it from the side, as you can see on the left, it becomes this big curtain that obscures your view and starts to shape the space. Along with not being just transparent because I'm using tubes, the tubes, because they're curved, refract light in a very different way. So I, I should have added another picture in here, but you can kind of see, um, I can't point to it. You can kind of see the, re the reflection of outside on that picture to the left. And if people were standing behind it, you'd expect to just see their shadow. But because of the refraction of the light, it actually kind of makes them disappear behind that curtain. So you'll see feet and outside, and it's a very fun and interesting experience. So I'm gonna bop through. So <clears throat> in 2020, I got my first studio space that was not in my home at the Delaware Contemporary Art Museum in Delaware um, and started my full-time artistic practice where I combined my visual arts with also production items that I could market because it was a business and I, as a working artist, needed to find a way to make money and do my art and find something kind of in that middle where I could do both at the same time. So my, I've always loved ceramics. I've worked in ceramics for quite a long time, and I found that that was a good time to kind of bring that back. Um, so I make functional ceramic pieces and porcelain jewelry. So I've made this and my earrings, um, and I've continued to create those pieces. I love adorning people and creating these special moments that people can wear with them if they need a little extra luck or they are scared and need some protection and the thought that I've touched something and made something that someone's gonna put on when they have something important to do I think is really special. Um, so this is me in my studio. I was lucky enough to be featured in Delaware today which is why I have this absolutely lovely photograph by Jill Del, Del Tufo of me working. Um, and that was a really fun thing. Again, continuing to make me feel like, okay, I'm doing this, people are seeing me, I'm getting more visibility and what I'm doing is, is valuable. A little bit more examples of my functional work. Um, do a lot of mugs. People really love mugs. <laughs> it's something that people can justify spending 35 to $50 on a piece of artwork that they get to use every day and is special. Here's a little more examples of my jewelry. I sell my jewelry online, and I also was lucky enough to have it at Longwood Gardens in their gift shop. So I'll talk a little bit more about my sculptural watercolor process. This piece is called Javen Pond Heron and was inspired by the Javen Pond Heron, which is a really beautiful bird. I saw a picture of it, and I was just so interested and enchanted by the colors of its plumage and the idea of all the colors in between that I really wanted to study that more. This piece is six foot by three foot and the sculptural watercolor process allowed me to come up with a way to work in color that also allowed me to work with color uh, textures, movement, and do so in a three-dimensional way. I'm a very three-dimensional person. I always have been. Um, so I've tried and done a lot of two-dimensional things, especially when trying to explore color. And generally, I'm not super happy with the results. 
um, because it's not the way that I like to work. Again, I like working with lots of little pieces that I can arrange and rearrange and see how it looks and change it and let the work speak to me. And so being able to do that where I can paint and create all these layers to work with and then take my time to arrange everything and play with all the pieces and touch everything and trim things and then add another further layer of depth to the piece and color combination um, was a really special way for me to start working um, more so with color. Here's some process photos once I actually painted all the paper. I also made this frame, so it's like a big tray. Um, and for this one especially, because it was so big, I didn't cut them all into individual strips when I started because I didn't want to have to pull together <laughs> thousands of <laughs> individual strips of paper. Um, so the chunkier ones at the top, I folded it like a fan. So I have these kind of packets of paper and I started planning out um, the way everything was gonna be laid out. And as I refined and was happy with where things were going, I started cutting it into the individual strips. For this piece, I painted 350 to 400 linear feet of paper that ranged from 12 inches wide to 24 inches wide. So that's an awful lot of paper. And doing this process took me, I think about a month um, of like all day painting, 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 woodworking, arranging, and all of that good stuff. So once the piece is done and all the paper's where I want it, I very carefully take sections out, pour glue into the back, and then stick the sections in so they're all connected to that back frame with glue, so no, nothing's going anywhere. Um, also, I will mention again that I came up with that process after lots of trial and error. There was lots of things that didn't work or took a really long time, ended up with hot glue gun burns, wasn't something that seemed archival or sustainable, um, and led to this process. And I would say most artists have a lot of failures and things that they hate before they get to that one piece that you actually get to see and everybody enjoys. Um, so <clears throat> like the Javen Pond Heron piece, these pieces are also inspired, but rather than being inspired by the natural world, um, these are actually my internal landscapes pieces, which was kind of funny that Kate had mentioned that as well. Um, so the first one is called I'm Fine, and if you can tell, it was not fine. <laughs> and the second one is called, I think I'm losing it. Um, I started kind of diving more into reflections of my emotional state of being or other people's emotional state of being and how I was perceiving that um, and trying to share my perceptions visually with others. Um, a lot of my work, whether it's based on emotional responses or and internal landscapes or the natural world often also elicits, especially in person, I think, um, emotional responses from people, which is one of the most rewarding things that I can experience when someone has an emotional response and connection with my work. Um, and it further kind of pushed me to share those emotional reflections of myself with others through my work. Um, another series that I started, which is very different and is um, with ceramics and fibers, was my artifacts series. As a black person in America, I have a lot of question marks about my an ancestry. Like, I can't trace it back however many generations, and even with uh, my mom is Armenian. Even with my Armenian side, um, her family went through the, what is it called? The Armenian Genocide and had to flee. Um, so there's also kind of this wall and end there that I don't get to experience or really know about without quite a lot of effort and research and still questions on my end. So I started kind of creating these um, artifact-like things that were very focused on um, 
materiality, tactile experience, that feeling of something that was discovered from somewhere that you have no idea, you know, what it symbolizes or represents, um, and kind of making up my own artifacts of my potential ancestors. Um, to do this, too, I also learned to spin wool. I'm very, very interested in materiality and lots of different processes. I've worked in so many mediums. I've bopped around into lots of things. I love learning new skills and new um, materials, and I kind of saw this as another opportunity to do that. Um, so there's porcelain, which is, um, has lace that I got from my mother impressed upon it, um, and then also a bunch of different fibers, including felted wool that I felted and yarn that I spun. Um, so here's just like a little bit more with my business and my artwork as a business. I do have an online shop. I participate and work with other artists. I go to art fairs and sell my work. I try to take advantage of any kind of opportunities for visibility um, that I think will serve me or are with people that I enjoy and want to work with and have, you know, community with. Um, if you look at the bottom, second in from the left, yes, um, you can see a table that's actually set with a bunch of dishes that I made um, for a chef called named Gerald Allen, um, and he's doing an art as food event. So we kind of swapped services, and he made a lot of beautiful food for a, an opening that I had of a solo show. For cost and I made all of these plates for his dinner um, for him to borrow which was really lovely so you know when I get the chance to work with other artists that I you know enjoy and respect I think that's really really valuable and I love I don't have a lot of time but if I'm gonna be donating my time anywhere or giving free time it's going to be to helping and supporting other people who are working really really hard and are willing to equally share and support, um, which is nice. I think we need to, to do that as a community. <laughs> um, and I think I just highlighted again how long installing this took. So this is something that you know I did for, as an opportunity for visibility. It took 40 plus hours of prep time on my part of flame working and packing and organizing and all of that. 16 plus hours to install because I actually had somebody assist me. Um, more than eight hours to deinstall. I had to rent a truck. I had to, I did like a, a swap for services with the preparator. So she came and helped me and I made her a bunch of plates. Um, so I do like to highlight that behind all of these lovely installations of work that we all get to experience. There's a ton of work and effort that, that goes into them that you wouldn't necessarily expect. Um, <clears throat> with these pieces, these are some of my earlier works where I was more focused on exploring purely color. So when I had first started with these sculptural watercolors, I started pretty basically and a lot of times I would pick two colors or even one color and just play with mixing those colors, all of the tones that I could get in mixing those colors over a painted surface as I was painting all of the paper. And then the second process of mixing and layering when I would arrange them into the frame. Um, I also started playing with movement, as you can see up with the piece to the right, where it doesn't have a frame and I'm playing with the perceived movement and motion um, that I can get from the material of the folded paper. Um, this piece is a little bit different because I painted it all in one piece. It's a 40 foot long piece of paper that I painted in eight foot sections and didn't disconnect. So I thought about what do I want this to look like when it's all condensed down and I had to plan that out when I was painting it as this long stretched piece, which was an interesting um, experience. This piece I did the same way, but generally that's not how I do my work. <laughs> it's a little bit more common that I have these strips and have the motion that is, um, that comes with creating curves and such within a framed, um, a square frame. 
Uh, these three pieces are also called Calm. They were the start of my Internal Landscapes series. And actually, that, that name for the series came out after I made them because not only did I feel a sense of calm when I looked at them, but I, ha I got that response multiple times from people experiencing my work. Um, these pieces are a study in blue and stormy. So that stormy piece is a little bit of a combination of playing with and exploring tonality because I only use one color. Um, and then the study in blue is playing with motion and the color blue. And that's it. Thank you.